Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining today for the Talking Animals Law and Philosophy series. My name is Eva Bernhard Kempers, and I'm a junior research associate at the Cambridge Center for Animal Rights Law. For those of you who are attending the Talking Animals series for the first time, just a quick note on the format. We'll start with a presentation of around 30 to 45 minutes. Then we'll have another 40 minutes for Q&A and discussion. The event will then end at around 6.30 p.m. UK time. You're all warmly invited to participate in the discussion. And in case you would like to ask a question or make a comment, you can either signal in the chat that you would like to say something, or you can just use the raise hand function, which you can find under the reactions button. I will then go through the chat or the raised hands in the discussion section, and I will allow you to directly ask your question to our speaker. So until this point, I will keep all attendees' microphones muted. We will be recording the presentation part of this event, and we will later be uploading the video to our website. We will not record the discussion part. So it is now my pleasure to introduce our speaker of today, Jonathan Birch. Jonathan Birch is a professor of philosophy at the LSE and principal investigator on the Foundations of Animal Sentience Project. In 2021, he led a review entitled Review of the Evidence of Sentience in Cephalopod Mollusks and Decapod Crustaceans which led to invertebrate animals, including octopuses, crabs, and lobsters, being included in the UK government's sentience bill. In addition to his interest in animal sentience, cognition, and welfare, he also has a long-standing interest in the evolution of altruism and social behavior. His first book, The Philosophy of Social Evolution, was published by Oxford University Press in 2017. So today, Jonathan will be speaking to us about welfare comparisons between different species and how the capabilities approach may help with that. So Jonathan, thank you for being with us and the floor is yours. Yes, thank you, Eva. Uh, thanks for unmuting me as well. I'll just share my uh, slides. But also, um, in addition to having the slides on the screen in front of you, you can also open them in a web browser if you like. That's particularly useful if you want to revisit anything that has gone before or if you want to click on any of the links that are embedded in the slides. So to do that, you can just go to bit.ly slash birchccarl which is uh, Cambridge Centre for, for Animal Rights Law, uh, for, for which I'm, I'm grateful for the invitation to speak in this seminar. Thanks to all of you for attending. So as Eva says, I'm a professor at the LSE where I direct a project called the Foundations of Animal Sentience Project. I'll very briefly introduce the project before turning to today's topic. There's this growing interest around the world in the topic of animal sentience. This has been really heartening for me as someone who has a long-standing interest in that topic. For me, a very significant moment was in 2016 when Stephen Harnad founded a journal called Animal Sentience that for seven years now has been hosting debates from scholars from, from many different disciplines on uh, the questions of what animals feel and the ethical and political and legal implications of what animals feel. I think of this as an emerging interdisciplinary field of animal sentience research involving my own discipline of philosophy, but also involving far more than that, drawing together people from comparative psychology, neuroscience, animal welfare science and veterinary science, evolutionary biology, behavioral sciences, and law. Of course, when you're trying to get people from so many different disciplines speaking to each other, as this journal does and as this, this seminar series we're in now does, you can get some conceptual problems, you can get people talking at cross purposes, you can get disagreement about the right methodologies to use. And so the field faces foundational challenges. My Foundations of Animal Sentience project that has been running since 2020, funded by the European Union, 
aims to try and make progress on those foundational controversies. We aim to develop better methods for studying the conscious experiences of animals scientifically, and we aim to find new ways of putting the science to work to design better policies, laws, and ways of caring for animals. There's always been this, this science-facing side and this policy-facing side. As Eva mentioned, we've taken a particular interest in invertebrates, like, like the bees in the logo there, and also octopuses, crabs, lobsters, because these are where some of the most interesting disputes are. People have vigorously disputed whether these animals feel anything or not. In fact, the evidence is is pointing towards it, it being rather likely that they do feel something like pain and that they can suffer and that their interests do need to be taken into account. Uh, we gave advice to the UK government along these lines, shaping the, the Animal Welfare Sentience Act in 2022. So if you want to get a sense of what we've been doing, there's a link to our website there. I'm going to talk today about my current thinking about uh, a problem on which I haven't previously written, this problem of uh, interspecies welfare comparisons. This seminar is quite a good opportunity to just present work in progress, ideas that are still in the process of being developed. The question is, is basically this, that given our ignorance of how intensely an animal suffers a deprivation or enjoys a reward, how should we make decisions about which animals to prioritize and why? That question you know, occurs in different forms in all kinds of different contexts, I think. Um, it occurs to people who are working with animals in settings like zoos and farms and need to make questions about, you know, what, what are the most serious welfare problems that are most deserving of my time? It's a question that also arises for, at the level of, of policy uh, when we're thinking about how to allocate resources to, for example, enforcing welfare standards in different areas. And it's a question that arrives in uh, arises in the animal advocacy world as well. For people who want to work to promote the interests of animals, which animals are they going to prioritize? Uh, what are the priority cause areas? And in all of those contexts, it's an extremely hard question. And it arises in in what we might call an intraspecies version, where we're trying to make comparisons across individuals or populations of the same species. And it arises in an interspecies version as well, where we're trying to make comparisons across species. And I mean, my sense is that the, the intraspecies version is already hard and the interspecies version is even harder. But the intraspecies version, so Heather Browning, worked on my project as a postdoc for two years and has recently taken up a lectureship at the University of Southampton. While she was working on my project, and since, I think, this has been one of her main focus areas, this problem of interspecies welfare comparisons. She published a pretty uh, you know, definitive paper on the issue at the beginning of this year. There's a link to it on the slide. Heather was a was a zookeeper for a long time before moving into philosophy and so has both lovely anecdotes and lovely photos of the animals she used to work with in, in, in her days working in a zoo. And um, she often introduces the problem with these two particular otters that she used to work with called Paddy and Sneezy, where they differed a great deal in their response to food reward. Uh, one of them was incredibly expressive and enthusiastic, and the other one was very reserved and didn't respond very much. And so if you're even in that setting where you've got two animals of the same species, extremely similar physiologically, neurally, uh, behaviorally, you still get these huge differences. And so you start to wonder, well, is it that one of them is in enjoying the reward far more, you know, should I be giving the other one different food or some different kind of reward? Or is it that they're enjoying the reward the same amount, but uh, their, behave their patterns of behavioral expression differ? How is one to even adjudicate questions like that when looking at two animals of the same species? It gets a whole lot harder, I think, if we just change the species of one of the animals and think, well, what if it's not 
large charismatic mammals anymore, but what if we want to make comparisons about the relative severity of welfare problems or the relative benefit of welfare interventions, one of them targeting a large familiar mammal like an otter and the other one targeting an animal much more evolutionarily distant from us, but probably still sentient, like a shrimp. The behavioral repertoires are now totally different. Um, they can still have food rewards and they can still suffer deprivations. And, and I think shrimps often suffer a great deal in farming settings where, for example, uh, practices like eye stalk ablation uh, are common, which involve cutting off the eye stalks of um, breeding shrimp. And uh, how how are we to adjudicate the 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 serious the relative seriousness of these problems? That you know, it could be that the shrimp uh, is is far less capable of suffering than the otter, but there's no strong reason to think that it could be that they're equally capable. It could be that the shrimp is suffering uh, far more. It's a problem that that resembles a problem we face even in the human case and that economists have, have had to face up to for a long time. In the human case, we face this problem of interpersonal comparisons uh, or interpersonal comparisons of well-being. It's one that is structurally similar to the problem of welfare comparisons in other animals. And so my hope is that, that some insights may be transferable from the case of human well-being to the case of animal welfare. So let's think about what economists have had to say about this problem. The root of it, as, as they've long recognized, is what we might call the inscrutability of experienced well-being. That humans, just, just like otters, presumably, and shrimps, vary in their hedonic experiences, their experiences of pleasures and pains, and they vary also in how those experiences relate to outward signs. Not everyone will suffer equally in response to the same deprivations. Not everyone experiences the same enjoyment, given the same advantages. Some people need a more intense subjective experience than others to display the same outward signs. These are all pretty familiar phenomena. Recognized even by very early economists like William Stanley Jevons in 1871, who writes in this book about economics that the reader will find there's never in any single instance an attempt made to compare the amount of feeling in one mind with that in another. I see no means by which such comparisons can be accomplished. The susceptibility of one mind may, for what we know, be a thousand times greater than that of another. But provided the susceptibility was different in a like ratio in all directions, we should never be able to discover the difference. Every mind is inscrutable to every other mind, and no common denominator of feeling seems to be possible. Sixty years later, uh, an economist who is pretty important in the history of the London School of Economics, Lionel Robbins, our library is named after him, um, made a very similar comment that he said there's no means of testing the magnitude of A's satisfaction as compared with B's. If we tested the state of their bloodstreams, that would be a test of blood, not satisfaction. Introspection doesn't enable A to discover what's going on in B's mind, nor B to discover what's going on in A's. There's no way of comparing the satisfactions of different people. So it seems... You know, on the face of it, this may make, make it sound very bleak, the idea that we could make such comparisons in other animals, when we struggle so much to make them, even in our own case, even in the case of other humans. You can think about your own friends and family and think how much pleasure do they, in, they experience, how, much, how intense are their pains, and you can be unsure. Of course, economists have, uh, have proposed solutions, and we can think about whether those solutions might help us with the case of other animals. I think of there being these, these two main paths economists have, have forged for trying to make principled comparisons among different people in the face of the inscrutability of experienced well-being. There's one that I would call the path of preference satisfaction, 
and the other one that I'll call the path of capabilities. I think there are reasons to prefer the second one. Um, nonetheless, the second one isn't isn't without its difficulties too. These paths have analogues in the case of animal welfare. Maybe reflecting on the paths taken by economists in the human case might help us choose which path to take in relation to other animals. So let's think first about the path of preference satisfaction. Perhaps the most common way in which economists have reacted to this observation that we don't know how intensely someone is suffering or enjoying their rewards or deprivations. Economist John Hassani crystallized this very nicely when he wrote that in deciding what is good and what is bad for a given individual, the ultimate criterion can only be his own wants and his own preferences. So one looks to the manifest preferences of, of a person to quantify, you know, how, how much how much well-being they, they're extracting from it. The basic idea is that to escape inscrutab the inscrutability that, that hits us when we think about subjective feelings of pain and pleasure, we should switch from thinking of well-being as a function of those feelings to thinking of it as a function of the extent to which somebody's preferences are satisfied. Now, don't ask how, how intensely you're enjoying that, uh, that cake or, or how much you are suffering from poverty. Ask instead, you know, how much would you, how much would you pay for that cake in effect? How strong is your preference um, for one state, one option over another? The thought is that there's nothing inscrutable about people's preferences. You can give them options. You can give them uh, lotteries where you get certain chances of different options. You can ask them what they would pay to have one option over another. You can get a lot of information about what people prefer. The preference is a fundamentally behavioral notion. Of course, it's not 100% behavioral. There are reasons behind my preferences. Uh, but the long-standing thought from people like Kasani is that economics doesn't have to worry about those reasons. They don't make any difference. Let's just study the behavior and, and model the behavior. This idea, in the human case, also faces standard problems and objections from people like John Rawls and Amartya Sen and Martha Nussbaum. These objections to the path of preference satisfaction focus on two main problems that what we're trying to do here when we're talking about well-being and comparing well-being is we're trying to capture something that is morally significant normatively significant something that we we ought to care about and when we talk about subjective feelings of pleasure and pain it's quite clear where the moral significance comes from but when we're talking about people's preferences, we have to be alert to ways in which their preferences might fail to track what matters morally. Partly because people might vary, for example, in their, e their ease of satisfaction. You might have two different people and one of them is just pretty content with whatever comes their way in life. So they're suffering quite a lot of hardship but it's not really on their mind that they might be doing a whole lot better. They're suffering a lot of injustice. Perhaps they're experiencing a lot of racism and sexism in their life. But uh, but they you know they're just pretty pretty contented and they don't have a strong preference for a life in which those things were taken away. Compare that to somebody else who does very strongly feel um, that they would very much prefer a life in which those deprivations were taken away it seems like any any function that prioritizes preference satisfaction is going to tell us to prioritize that second person over the first because the first already you now that they're, they're already very easily satisfied we need to do work to prioritize that second one so depending on the details it might turn out either way but it's certainly not going to say treat them the same it's probably going to say prioritize the second and for critics like like Rawls, that's a problem because there's no reason to think that just because somebody is more easily satisfied, their well-being should count for less when we're setting priorities. And then there's this second problem that uh, people's preferences 
also reflect the extent to which they've acquiesced to their circumstances. The literature on so-called adaptive preferences. For Martha Nussbaum, for example, a big concern is that, well, there's various circumstances in which um, you know, women in extremely patriarchal cultures might end up reporting that you know, they'd rather not go to school or that um, you know, they'd rather not receive education because, uh, well, they, they, they see the costs very vividly, they see the potential consequences very vividly, and they don't attach a lot of weight to the potential benefits. And there's this question of, well, should one, one follow Hassani there and say, well, they're the experts on what is good for them. So if they prefer not to have education, we shouldn't see that as a priority. Or should we see that as a serious problem? And for, for people like Nussbaum, the critics of the path of preference satisfaction, it is indeed a serious problem because the fact that people under certain circumstances will acquiesce to those social norms and end up not preferring education, that doesn't mean that uh, education isn't crucial to achieving well-being in the sense that matters morally. So they argue that preference satisfaction is a very poor proxy for what actually matters. And I think that, that those concerns apply when we look at the analogue of the path of preference satisfaction in the case of an animal welfare. But certainly one uh, a way of approaching these problems of inscrutability of experience well-being when we compare our otters or when we compare an otter to a shrimp is to say, let's define animal welfare in a way that makes no appeal to subjective feelings and just talks about preferences and health. This is Marianne Stamp Dawkins' view in a couple of books, including this recent one, The Science of Animal Welfare. The Dawkins in, in the 80s was a strong and early proponent of the idea that animal welfare should be fundamentally about subjective feelings, but she later became quite um, sceptical of that. She thought it led to serious problems relating from its inscrutability, and so proposed instead that good, good welfare is a situation where the animal is healthy and has what it wants. Look at indicators of health and look at its preferences. This view, I think, faces the same basic problems as, as the path of preference satisfaction in the human case. That if you define animal welfare in those ways, yes, you can make comparisons of a kind, um, but you're no longer tracking what matters morally. You're tracking, we well, might be in part tracking what matters morally, you know, the experiences of suffering and pleasure and whatever else you think matters morally. You might well be in part tracking that. But also mixed in with that, there's partly how, how easily the animal is satisfied and how much it's acquiesced to its circumstances. So you might find, for example, um, you know, strong uh, preferences for what is familiar, even if what is familiar is not very good. You might find, for example, chickens preferring enclosed environments or cramped environments to being allowed outdoors. Um, because of the greater familiarity of those indoor environments. And you you face the same problem that you face with the girls who don't want education. You know, you could take the path of saying, well, the animal is the expert on what it, what is good for it. So if it prefers the indoor conditions, those must be better. But I think you could equally have this concern that the um, the preferences partly reflect acquiescence to circumstances. Uh, and that this can come apart from what is actually good for the animal and what is a good constituents of its of its welfare. So very much the same concerns arise. There's also what you might call a further problem or a further advantage, or an advantage, depending on your your prior sympathies. Because when it comes to interspecies comparisons, there's really only one th one principled thing that you can say if you have a preference satisfaction view, which is that satisfaction of one's top preference gets a one, and uh, you know failure to have even your your preference above the bottom of your ranking gets a zero, and that's the same whatever species you are. 
Now, so if you ask ask the question about Paddy and Shrimpy, and ask, well, you know, imagine uh, their top and bottom preferences. So, so a state that they'd prefer anything to, and a, and a state that uh, they prefer to anything. What weight are these states to to receive in our calculations for deciding who to prioritize? Well, if welfare just is preference satisfaction and there's no further facts beyond pre preference satisfaction, like how in, that are relevant, like how intensely they're enjoying the state or how intensely they're suffering in the state, then there can be no principled non-discriminatory basis for any differential weighting. It's a point that's been made in the human case by Dan Hausman, a philosopher of economics, but it applies in the, in the non-human case as well, that there's only one way you could end up giving different weight, greater weight to Paddy over Shrimpy, uh, namely a speciesist bias that just says, well, because of the species, we will uh, use a multiplier to give greater weight to the preference satisfaction of Paddy. And so it seems if you combine the path of preference satisfaction with the rejection of speciesism, this will have radically revisionary implications for prioritization. That um, if you think about you know, the numbers of shrimps in shrimp farming, the severity of the welfare problems, the, the severity of their deprivations, uh, it seems very hard to avoid the conclusion that um, to the extent that that uh, efforts in, in all of these areas, policy and uh, individual care and animal advocacy, have all tended to invest more effort in in large mammals than than shrimps that is impossible to justify uh, given this combination of views you can see why i say this is a further problem or an advantage depending on your prior sympathies because some people might cheer that outcome and say well that's absolutely right that we should indeed reprioritize towards these small invertebrates many uh, would disagree so i think um in any case, the path of preference satisfaction, it gives us a way of making comparisons, but that way is quite quite seriously flawed in the human case, and those same flaws carry over to the non-human case. This, in, in economics, led to an influential different path, the path of capabilities that I think might be um, somewhat more promising in the case of other animals. To explain the, the nature of this path, perhaps it's good to go uh, right back to Robbins. Remember Robbins said, experience well-being is totally inscrutable. You cannot make comparisons uh, in a principled way because we don't know how intensely people feel things. He goes on to say, now, of course, in daily life, we do continually assume that comparison can be made. But the very diversity of the assumptions made at different times in different places is evidence of their conventional nature. In Western democracies, we assume for certain purposes that men in similar circumstances are capable of equal satisfactions. It goes on to say, well, just as for purposes of justice, we assume equality of responsibility. So for purposes of public finance, we agree to assume equality of capacity for experiencing satisfaction. But although it may be convenient to assume this, there's no way of proving that it rests on fact. I find this a very um, bleak vision, actually. This is, this is Robin's way of solving the problem of interpersonal comparisons. And it's one that is very bleak because he's saying, well, interpersonal comparison rests on the conventional adoption of false assumptions simply because they're convenient. It's convenient to... Uh, assume that everyone suffers roughly equally from the same deprivation uh, and that that convenience is at the heart of these comparisons that would be you know that'd be very bleak if true but i think there's another much more optimistic reaction which is you know takes us onto the path of capabilities a reaction i associate with amartya sen which is to ad admit that in the end in the human case, interpersonal comparisons does rest on social norms of a kind, but they're not conventional. They're not just, you know, arbitrary. We we compare this way, but we could have compared 
a totally different way and that would have been fine it's rather that as with as with legal responsibility those norms of comparison are justified not by convenience but by considerations of fairness or justice to me that is the the idea at the heart of the the capabilities approach to well-being that treating people fairly requires that we regard certain types of deprivation as equally bad for them and requires regarding certain types of functioning as equally good for them that that if you're asking how much are they enjoying this you know how, how much is this girl enjoying education versus this one uh, you're asking one question too many you you are introducing a difference when in fact fairness requires us to regard it as equally bad for any human being to have a certain kind of fun fundamental deprivation like being deprived of access to education or access to food shelter and so on if you think of you know scrooge and tiny tim in the in the christmas carol it could well be that um you know suppose they're both fe feeling a bit hungry suppose that scrooge who, who has a lifestyle in which he's very unaccustomed to hunger suffering absolutely terribly from this you know he feels the hunger unbelievably intensely it's just awful for him whereas tiny tim is a very stoical character who is extremely accustomed to hunger and so barely feels it. It, it the intuition for for sen and others in the capabilities tradition is that it would just be so clearly unfair to prioritize the nourishment of scrooge on that basis you've got your loaf of bread who are you going to give it to to say well who is suffering the most oh scrooge is suffering the most i'll give it to him It'd be completely unfair um the fact that Tim is managing the deprivation stoically does not mean that um, the deprivation is 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 less serious for him. And in fact, we might think in certain ways it's uh, it's more serious for for Tim than for Scrooge. But that allowing variation in how bad the fundamental deprivations are based on how intensely the subject feels them or disprefers them just creates ground in which unfairness and injustice can thrive. In the human case, I think that is this really, you know, pretty plausible thought. It's led to a literature in which uh, theorists try to characterize what these fundamental deprivations are that are equally bad for all humans. And you get the argument that they're deprivations in relation to basic capabilities. Sen's original list of these basic capabilities was actually very uh, short. He said the ability to move about to meet one's nutritional requirements, um, to be clothed and sheltered, and to participate in the social life of the community. That to be deprived of these things is equally bad, whoever you are, wherever you are in the world. And to ask a further question about how much are they suffering really is totally inappropriate. And you know that I think is really, really important insight. And uh, it's led to what's called the capabilities approach to human development associated with this famous index called the Human Development Index that tries to assess how well different countries are doing, not by the metrics of, of GDP and not by how happy people are either, but rather by the extent to which people in those countries have their basic capabilities um, secured. Now, the list um, was almost certainly too short you know, from Sen. Martha Nussbaum, in developing this capabilities approach, has a rather longer list. And also, you know, relevantly for our purposes, in recent work, has sought to extend that approach to not just humans, the group for which it was originally designed, but all sentient animals which I find a very interesting idea and one that might that has the potential to, to help with this problem of, of interspecies comparisons. Nussbaum's list is a bit longer than, than Sen's. It includes uh, these, these 10 categories of life, bodily health, bodily integrity, senses, imagination and thought, emotions, practical reason, attachment and bonding, harmony with other species, play and control over one's environment. And her claim is that we should aim to secure these things up to a minimum threshold for all sentient animals, where each of the 10 things is understood 
in a species appropriate way. Many questions you might have about this. Um, a lot of the you know, issues that I won't get into in this talk are discussed in a, in a review I've written with my PhD student, Eva Reed, called Animal Sentience and the Capabilities Approach to Justice that recently came out in Biology and Philosophy. But certainly one obvious question you'll have is which animals? Which animals are to be regarded as sentient when we're trying to secure their basic capabilities? And Nussbaum in the book defends um, a view that is close to my own view uh, and that is relatively inclusive compared to others in that Nussbaum really thinks um, you know, shrimps are in here. The, the, the group of sentient animals includes all vertebrates, cephalopod mollusks like octopuses, squid, cuttlefish, but also she says crustaceans. And I think she means specifically the decapod crustaceans including crabs, lobsters, crayfish, shrimps. A huge issue that we talk about in our review is about whether insects are also in that list, whether the evidence concerning insects has risen to the level where when theorizing about our um, obligations, one should regard them as sentient. And um, I'm inclined to think, yes, and I'm inclined to think insects should be in the list on the basis of the evidence that I've seen. But then that, it's a move one should not take lightly because it expands the size of the group, group of animals regarded as sentient by a factor of about 20. Suddenly you've got 20 times more animals um, who have a claim to having these basic entitlements secured. And the question of how one even begins to secure these entitlements for insects is, is one that has barely been discussed and is absolutely huge. Let's think about how this capabilities approach might help with our problem of interspecies comparisons. I'll start with the intraspecies case, which is where I think it is most obviously promising. Because if you, if you go back to Heather's, Otter's, Paddy and Sneezy, I think what the capabilities approach says is to handle these as you, as you would the comparison of Scrooge and Tiny Tim, or the... Um, you know, the imagined sort of girl in Afghanistan versus girl in, in America whose who's claim to education is stronger. Um, the, what the capabilities approach would say is that, well, as members of the same species, these individuals have the same central capabilities. Um, and just as it would be, be wrong to say the girl in America has different central capabilities from the girl in Afghanistan, one should not um, distinguish between these two otters. One should focus on giving them both equal opportunities to realize their central capabilities and that it's an inappropriate question to ask who enjoys the food more or who suffers more from uh, you know, being deprived of food or from various other deprivations. And to me, that is quite, a, quite an attractive way to think about the within species case, that we should think about it not in terms of trying to measure the intensity of subjective feelings, but rather in terms of um, how well these individuals are all doing against a benchmark that tries to assess to what extent are their central capabilities secured. Of course, there are problems with this approach. One is that, I mean, the work has barely begun, actually, to uh, construct accounts of what the central capabilities are for many species, including otters. Nussbaum in the book sadly does not undertake that work. She just says, well, that's a project for the future to, to actually develop serious accounts, you know, analogues of the human development index for other, other species that try to capture how well, are the, how well are the shrimps doing, how well are the chickens doing. And moreover, even though there is a substantial field of animal welfare science, it has not really been doing that. You know, it has not really been seeing its aims as analogous to those of developmental economics. It has not been constructing indices of the relevant type. So if, if we go this route, there's a huge amount of work to be done and it's barely started. And you quickly get to very fundamental issues about how to interpret these, these capacities. Take the first one, the one for uh, the life. Um, in the human case, this, it, this involves uh, for Nussbaum the, the uh, 
capability to live to a normal lifespan. If you're not securing that by having high child mortality, for example, then you're not doing very well as a country. But then um, she words the words it quite differently when it comes to other animals and ends up saying, well, this is still this is still the case for mammals and birds, that they still have that entitlement, um, but probably not the case for fish. And this is one of the the really strange parts of the book. We comment on this in our in our review where the. You know, the rationale for for not thinking that um, the entitlement to life um, in fish precludes killing them is is very uh, poorly argued, I think, and relies on the idea that they have no uh, concern for the future, which there's not really any reason to believe. So there's there's some there's a huge amount of work that hasn't yet been done, and also you immediately run into some very controversial issues very quickly. Nonetheless, you know, there's something exciting about the vision here, you know, that if we had species specific indices rating how we're doing in securing the basic entitlements of different animals, that would be surely a good thing. But it wouldn't um, in itself solve the problem of interspecies comparisons. It would give us indices that help us with the within species comparisons. But then you'd face the question of how do you make comparisons across the indices? You've got your you know, your shrimp welfare index that says, well, shrimp, shrimps in aquaculture are not having their central capabilities secured. They're, they're a long way off. They're doing very badly. And then you have this other index over here that perhaps says, um, you know, could be, uh, let's think of um, pigs or something like that. And again, it enumerates lots of lots of ways in which pigs are not having their central capabilities secured in uh in farming and then you have to make some kind of comparison for which is the more serious problem deserving of the higher priority and it's not clear the capabilities approach has much to say about how to, how to make those interspecies comparisons there is one way we could go here which would be to say that um you know just as in the within species case certain types of fundamental deprivation are equally bad whoever experiences them maybe this is also true in the the interspecies case for all sentient animals so maybe um you know if you have sort of hungry otter and a hungry shrimp they're both be they're both experiencing certain kinds of fundamental deprivation deprivation of food um you could just carry that intuition over from the tiny Tim Scrooge case and say, well, it's just as it would be unfair to take um, Scrooge's deprivations more seriously than Tim's because of the, his intensity of feeling. It would also be unfair to take the otter's deprivations more seriously than the shrimp's, despite the, uh, the fact that in various ways the, the otter will be more cognitively sophisticated and say, well, it's no different from the Scrooge and Tiny Tim case in that respect. That is definitely one way you could go. It's really, um, that it, that would be bold, though. That would be bold, and I'm not sure if it would be be right. Um, there's sort of problems looming either way, I think. But if we, if we say no here, no, it's not unfair to take Paddy's deprivations more seriously than Shrimpy's. It's not unfair to to discriminate here on the basis of cognitive sophistication and things like that. It seems like the you know the bedrock that that allows capabilities approaches to secure comparison has been taken away. Um, it's not clear there's any bedrock anymore that could allow principled interspecies comparisons because the bedrock, as I've suggested, for for any capabilities approach. The bedrock has to be that certain fundamental deprivations are equally bad for whoever experiences them. If we if we kick that away, it's not clear how interspecies comparisons can be made in a principled rather than arbitrary way. But then if we say yes, you know, yes, um, those fundamental deprivations are equally bad, whether experienced by an otter or a shrimp, it seems we are back with the conclusion that there will be radically revisionary implications. The cause prioritization 
so we seem to be back at that that point that was either a advantage or a or a problem depending on your your prior sympathies you know it seems like this view too will, will most likely end up telling us to redirect our efforts very strongly in favor of the um vast uh, numbers of shrimps now some people some people are certainly willing to accept that there's this group of organizations that has been springing up in recent years that i find quite interesting like the shrimp welfare project and uh, crustacean compassion and even more recently there's now an insect welfare research society which i've been them on the advisory board of and a new one called the insect institute um a lot of these in the the sort of effective altruism community and uh, i sort of find it quite interesting that you know some people really are willing to accept the fact that well on most most ways one can come up with of making these interspecies welfare comparisons um you know either there's no way of doing it or if there is shrimps slash insects end up dominating the calculation they're willing to accept that and maybe they're right um maybe they're right there's certainly it's certainly a difficult issue to contemplate though and possible tensions I suppose between this idea that we should prioritize the most this most serious welfare problems the the worst off our discovery that um the only reasonable ways of doing that we can currently think of end up telling us to prioritize small but incredibly numerous invertebrates that are treated incredibly badly like shrimps bit of tension between that and I suppose many of the motivations that bring people to animal welfare and animal advocacy in the first place motivations that often have a lot to do with empathetic connections with mammals and birds and so it's quite a hard thing to accept that we might have to shift our priorities away from them uh for the, for the re sort of reasons I've been describing so I'm not quite you know I'm interested to hear um reactions to this my sort of current thinking about it is that i cannot think of a principled way to make interspecies welfare comparisons that would not end up giving enormous weight to the interests and welfare needs of uh, invertebrates like shrimps uh, if you want to read more about our reactions to nussbaum's book that as i say there's that review animal sentience and the capabilities approach to justice if you want the slides, the, the link is in the chat, bit.ly slash uh, Birch um, C. Carl. And I look forward to your questions. Thanks very much for your attention.